Hello everybody, it is Michael Pierce here, at long last. Uh, took a little longer than I'd hoped to make my next video, but that's okay. I've been busy, busy, busy with graduate school. It's going really well. Um, I'm happy about that. Today, as the title of the video suggests, I am talking about two common criticisms of the MBTI. And uh, I have a script here that I will be looking at, um, which I actually wrote this script about a month ago. And uh, before I came out here, well, I guess more than a month ago, before I came out here, and I had wanted to make it more uh, uh, attacking a number of criticisms of the MBTI, but I realized I really, to do that properly, I'd need to do more research, particularly on the accusations on the validity, because um, I, I, I'm just not up to date enough on that, and I wanted to, I didn't want to uh, say anything stupid if I could help it. So um, it sat around for a bit, but I've decided, you know what, I, these first two common criticisms, I'd, I'd, I'd like to get this script out because I feel like it's a good one. So I'm just going to read it to you and um, maybe make a few comments along the way. Uh, just so you know, the two criticisms I'll be dealing with are first of all the ad hominem against Myers and Briggs uh, lack of official credentials and also the accusation of the four effect. So I just wanted to give some thoughts on, on, this, on this matter. So here we go. Um, so first, the first criticism is Myers and Briggs credentials. So this is, this is a strangely common criticism. Uh, I say it's strangely common because despite how often I have heard this come up, um, it's a blatant ad hominem, and it is irrelevant to the question of the MBTI's validity. The only way to determine the test's validity is to study the test, not the people who made it. Bringing up their credentials before examining the instrument serves no purpose other than to, as it were, poison the well. Uh, we might as well bring up Erwin Schrodinger's uh, sexual misconduct or Heisenberg's Nazism when discussing the validity of their theories. Unpleasant as these historical facts are in a discussion of quantum physics, they would only serve as a distraction. It's an elementary fallacy, and frankly, people ought to know better. I don't know why it keeps coming up. Well, I have theories on why it comes up, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, now, what makes the ad hominem even stranger is the fact that it just as well could be a compliment. Um, in other words, oh, look how far Myers and Briggs got without all of the privileges of a formal education. Why are they not celebrated as the underdogs they were? Many of the greatest scientific advancements were made not by tenured professors, but by outsiders. Um, Michael Faraday, one of my heroes, actually, single-handedly laid the basis for all modern understanding of electromagnetism and invented the first electric motor, which literally revolutionized the world. And yet, uh, aside from his own reading, Faraday's only scientific education consisted in a dozen lectures on natural philosophy, uh, science at the time, and four lectures on chemistry around 1812. Uh, furthermore, he had next to no knowledge of mathematics. I, I think he knew some algebra, <laughs> and that's what he knew. Um, his ideas had to be translated into mathematics by later scientists, most notably J.C. Maxwell. So that's Faraday. Why couldn't Myers and Briggs do the same for empirical personality theory? Their lack of formal education is not grounds for dismissing them. We all know this, or I thought we all knew this. Um, but even if we let the ad hominem by, if we accept it, it still runs us into problems. For one, where exactly were Myers and Briggs supposed to get this education in psychology that would satisfy their critics? Psychology was still in its infancy at the time. Uh, Myers and Briggs were technically contemporaries of Jung. They, he, Jung didn't die till the 1950s, and they were starting to work in the 1930s and 1940s. So who exactly would you trust them to learn from in America so that they might meet your modern standards? And even granting, because I don't know for sure, 
but even granting that a sufficiently empirical psychology that was entirely free from other poppycock or, or things that crop up when you're first beginning something, even granting that was there and was indeed being taught in America at the time, do you really think that they would admit in the 1930s, 1940s to married women to study it formally? <laughs> would you... Would you rather that Briggs and Myers have stayed in the kitchen and let the men make the MBTI? Um, and yes, I am going to get into this because I cannot help... This is going to get me into trouble, but I'm going to say it anyway because I'm, I'm actually really bugged by this. I cannot help but taste, and it's not, it's not intentional. I know it's not intentional, but it's, it's implied, and I, I hear it when people say it, that this ad hominem against Briggs and Myers has... It has this misogynistic flavor to it. Um, there's this sense that Briggs and Myers were these presumptuous housewives. They were naive to the hard facts of the manly sciences, and they were peddling this soft-hearted New Age nonsense that just makes everybody feel good instead of knowing their place and letting the, the educated, hard men run the show. I Again, I'm sure people will resent these accusations and accuse me of hypocrisy, and that's fair enough. But if that imagery is not the intended connotation, then pray tell what is. By mentioning their lack of formal training, do critics mean to imply the historical truth that in lieu of formal education and given uh, occasions of prejudice against them for their sex, these two women labored for years researching the subject on their own initiative alone while being married and raising a family at the same time. That Isabel Myers in particular spent decades developing the MBTI, testing, gathering data, making adjustments, refining definitions and questions, cooperating with schools and universities, often having to hound them or track down the administrators in order to get a hold of the data that she needed in order to make it a legitimate empirical test right, in order to test it and make sure that it actually worked and, and solved some of these problems to the best of her ability at the time. And that to, in, in, by the way, in order to make an empirical test of Jung's ideas, which unfortunately in the past, I'm thinking of my very first videos, I made a comment or, or two where I, I said um, that Jung's ideas were not meant to be made into a, te into a test. I was essentially downplaying on, I was, uh, on the MBTI. I was talking down a bit on the MBTI, and that ad attitude has definitely changed. While I do feel that it, um, people who only learn MBTI are getting a very simplified nature of where the, what the type descriptions mean, nevertheless, I think it has not been properly recognized by people how incredible the achievement is that they really did, you know, it has flaws for sure, but they made an empirical test from Jung's ideas, <laughs> from Carl Jung, who is this highly philosophical um, mind, very intentionally um, ambiguous at certain points, and yet they still operationalized um, his ideas and were the first to do so and to think that you could do that and thereby made it so that you could get the ideas to people without them having to learn young and get an actual effect. It's incredible. It's, it really, it, it baffles and really bothers me now that this is not, <laughs> that they are not praised for this. And it makes no sense to me because they're women. So this is a perfect opportunity that I remember being in, I didn't write this down, but I remember being in a, in a, in a classroom um, for psychology where the female professor who was clearly had, had feminist leanings was talking down on Myers and Briggs for their lack of credentials. That's part of why I, I included the misogynistic thing in here, because I'm like, what, why, I just don't understand. <laughs> like, and, okay, well, I'll get into the real, so, it, it, it's, it's an incredible, it's, it's incredible, I'll finish off this part of the script. It, 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 they're, they're neglecting the legacy of two remarkable women whose work has, whether you like it or not, genuinely benefited and will continue to benefit millions of people by their own testimonies. Okay, um, 
I will now suggest an ad hominem of my own in order to explain what's going on here, because I think that this criticism expresses an academic envy for the overwhelming success of the non-academic Myers and Briggs. I think there is an unconscious resentment of the fact that the most popular and profitable and long-lasting personality test ever made was not made by formally trained psychologists, which implies that formal education is not a sufficient or even necessary condition for success in psychology. And that is a hard pill to swallow. Um, yeah, it's, it's also worth noting that as far as I'm concerned, the Big Five is an independent confirmation of the, of the genius of Carl Jung uh, as operationalized by Myers and Briggs, because the, the Big Five with the with the exception of neuroticism, which I think is the weakest of the of the five traits anyway, um, the traits can be neatly correlated conceptually with the traits provided by MBTI. I talk, I believe, a little bit about that in my critique of the Big Five, but anyway. So yes, I am passionate about this. I'm sure I've lost support because of it. I I'll see how much of my anger comes back to bite me, but the reason I will pay that price is because I feel that two remarkable women are having their legacy trampled upon, and that really does bother me to no end, as I've really thought about it. So, um, so cut it out, <laughs> people. Like, you really ought to know better. This is ridiculous. So anyway, okay, so that's Myers and Briggs credentials. The next portion is on the Forer effect, um, which is another common thing that's brought up with the MBTI. So let's talk about the Forer effect. Uh, the forer effect occurs when a high number of people all feel the same personality description was, as it were, tailor-made for them, when in fact it is a highly generic one-size-fits-all description, which is in fact why so many people can relate to it. So it refers to a discrepancy between how special the described person feels versus how specific the description actually is. It is a common criticism of astrology or fortune telling, um, but it applies to anything that offers personality descriptions like the MBTI. The effect is named after American psychologist Bertram Forer, and this story is, I actually think, insightful for understanding what, what's going on, what the Forer effect really means. In 1948, Forer administered a personality test to his 39 students. Afterwards, Forer gave each student a bullet point list of personality characteristics supposedly based on their answers to the test. This, however, was not true. Forer, in fact, gave each student the exact same list, which he copied from, as he describes it in the paper, um, that, that where he wrote this up, uh, a newsstand astrology book. Right? So it included statements like, and I quote, you have a great need for other people to like and admire you. Uh, you have a tendency to be critical of yourself. And uh, you have found it unwise to be frank in revealing yourself to others. Those are a few of the things on the list. The students were then asked to rate the accuracy of each bullet point. Uh, the overwhelming majority of the students believed the test to be highly accurate. Forer concludes that people have a tendency to be overly impressed by vague statements and to endow the diagnostician with an unwarrantedly high degree of insight. Sorry, that was a direct quotation beginning with tendency to be overly impressed by vague statements and then unquote at the end. Um, that is directly quoting Forer from his paper, which I'll link to in the description below. All right, so that's the origin of the Forer effect. So first of all, the Forer effect cannot serve as a critique of a test itself, uh, or of a test's underlying theory, or even of a test's conclusions, but only of one, the writing style of its personality descriptions, in correlation with two, what Forer calls the test subject's gullibility for those descriptions. Um, in fact, uh, Concerning the writer, sorry, you can look at the article yourself and see what I'm talking about, but concerning the writing style of, of personality descriptions, Forer wrote, quote, 
Personality evaluations can be, and often are, couched in such general terms that they are meaningless in terms of denotability in behavior." Unquote. Uh, while I have always tried to distinguish behavioristic descriptions from cognitive descriptions, I do still agree with the spirit of what he's saying. I completely agree. A personality description should clearly distinguish personalities from each other. It should not just say, you are this, because it should say you are this as opposed to that, so that you see, in some sense, you are providing the opportunity to, to be falsified by saying not just a positive statement, but if you're not this and I'm wrong, then conceptually you would have to be this, and then it's more clear where you can insert the criticism. Um, and, and it just makes it much more clear what you're even saying to the person. Um, so I've tried to do that. Um, I'm happy to report that, at least as my descriptions go, I think I am usually in the clear, as far as Forer is concerned, and I also believe that the MBTI has done everything it can to remain in the clear as well. The critics of the MBTI, of course, do not agree with this, and that is where the problem lies. The Forer effect does not provide a set standard for what counts as overly general in a personality description. How general is too general? Between describing everyone and describing no one, where is the sweet spot of meaningfulness versus that of the forer effect? This is not provided by the forer effect, and that's because it never can be provided. Um, pardon me, I misread a part of the thing. I, I wish I could edit this, but I'm, not, I'm too lazy to. This is never provided, and it is never provided because it likely can't be provided. What are we supposed to do? Make a list of words deemed over-general that cannot be used in a description? Dictate a ratio of complementary to pejorative descriptors? Who decides what counts as overly general or overly complementary? By what objective standard would this or could this be decided? The great irony of the Forer effect is that, in some sense, it suffers from the Forer effect. It is so general that it could be used feasibly to describe almost every personality description, and this is precisely because, as I said before, it offers no counterexamples of what a sufficiently specific personality description should look like, nor any standards that can be followed to ensure one's description is, in fact, in the clear. One just sort of has to feel that it's specific enough and doesn't feel like astrology. Uh, you know, does this feel like it's overly general and vague? Frankly, the Forer effect functions, functions, I'm not saying it is, but the way that people use it, it's really just an insult. It's not a serious critique, because the critique opens up a way for you to fix the problem. Um, it is especially handy as an insult, because the accused is provided no way to absolve themselves. They cannot appeal to their client's satisfaction, because that is precisely what is under suspicion. But what else can they do? Appeal to their client's dissatisfaction? Say, hey, this is a, you know this is an accurate test because I just pissed off everybody and they didn't think it was true. Well, they're just in denial because I'm the psychologist. So the Forer effect does not offer any new measure of success. It only tears down the measure we already have, which is really the, what the clients say about it. Do the clients think that it's accurate? It thus leaves its victims without any means of redemption, and when someone gives criticism without clear advice on how to change, this indicates that the real goal is not the improvement of the thing criticized, but its destruction. A for the Forer effect conceals a desire to get rid of personality descriptions altogether, otherwise it would provide clearer means for a given personality t test to improve itself. But this is never offered. The critics who invoke the Forer effect, I believe, just want the test to die. In regards to the satisfied clients, by the way, the Forer effect is equally insulting. The key word which has always accompanied the Forer effect, from the very beginning, by the way, um, is gullible. Anyone who feels they got something out of a test description is called gullible. Forer's original paper, as I've sort of alluded to, is subtitled A Classroom Demonstration of Gullibility. The question is, in what way are they gullible? For the Forer effect presupposes 
right? It presupposes the accuracy of the personality description. Otherwise, it could not be described as universally valid or overly general, to use Forer's phrases. The gullibility of the test takers is not towards the accuracy of the descriptions. We're presupposing that they're accurate. It's rather towards how tailor-made they seem to them. In other words, the client thinks they are more special than they really are. But this is hardly a mark against the test itself. After all, the whole point of personality tests is to show how similar we are, not to the entire population, but to a large subset of it. So, you know, if you're sitting in the room and someone else gets the same description of, of, as you, does that make it the forward effect? Well, no, because there's 16 other descriptions. Um, so, anyway, that's, that's, where, my script, that's where my script ends. Um, I just wanted to get that off my chest. Because, uh, I, yeah, I haven't really addressed many of the criticisms and things, and those are just sort of two common things that are really rather easy to dismiss um, and say, listen, that's just not... I'm, but if anything, I'm just kind of tired of hearing it, <laughs> so so I wanted to put my two cents in. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you found it useful and interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, I I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.